Okay. Doug, we're ready to go. Okay. The subcommittee will come to order. Uh, I want to welcome uh, members participating in uh, today's hearing. Uh, and uh, for those remotely, members uh, uh, who are joining remotely uh, must be visible uh, on screen uh, for the purposes of identity verification, establishing and maintaining a quorum, uh, participating in the proceedings and voting. Those members uh, must continue uh, to use the software platform's video function uh, while, on, while in attendance unless they experience connectivity issues or other technical problems that, that render them uh, unable uh, to participate on camera. If a member experiences technical difficulties, they should contact the committee staff for assistance. Video of members' participation uh, will be broadcast uh, in the room and via the television's uh, internet feeds. Members participating remotely must seek recognition verbally, uh, and they are asked to mute their microphones when they, are not, when they are not speaking. Members who are participating remotely are reminded to keep the, uh, the software platform's video functions on the entire time that they attend the proceeding. Members may leave and rejoin the proceeding. If members depart for a short while uh, for reasons other than joining a, a different proceeding, uh, they should leave the video function on. If members uh, will be absent for a significant period or depart to join a different proceeding, uh, they should exit the software platform entirely and then rejoin if they return. Members may use the software platform's chat feature to communicate with staff regarding technical or logistical support issues only. Finally, uh, I've designated a committee staff member to, if necessary, mute unrecognized members' microphones to cancel any inadvertent background noise uh, that may disrupt uh, the uh, proceeding. Uh, before I go to my opening statement, uh, I understand that uh, there will be votes uh, during the course of the the hearing, uh, very likely. So um, if that has uh, um, that occurs, we are going to keep the hearing uh, going uh, as what has been worked out. And uh, unless it becomes it becomes an issue, we will uh, proceed. Members will go and vote and then return as soon as possible. But the hearing will uh, will continue. So. Uh, with that, I'm going to now uh, give my uh, my opening statement. Uh, let me say that I am pleased to welcome four commissioners from the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence, a commission created by this committee in the John S. McKay National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2019 to consider the methods and means necessary to advance the development of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and associated technologies to comprehensively address the national security and defense needs of the United States. Our intent for this commission was to ensure a bipartisan whole of government effort focused on solving national security issues. And we appreciate the leadership and the hard work of our witnesses in supporting the commission's efforts in that spirit. Today, we welcome Dr. Eric Schmidt, chairman of the commission, the Honorable Robert Work, vice chairman, the Honorable Mignon, Clyburn, Commissioner uh, of the, on the Workforce and Ethics Lines of Effort, and Dr. Jose Marie Griffiths, uh, Commissioner uh, on the Ethics Line of Effort and the Chair uh, of the Workforce Team. Uh, our understand, I want to thank you all, uh, first of all, for your service as well as your, your other uh, commissioners and look forward to uh, hearing your testimony uh, today. Our understanding of artificial intelligence started uh, in the 1950s and 60s through research funded through the Department of Defense's Vital Science and Technology Investments by the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, uh, or DARPA, uh, and the, the Office of Naval Research, uh, and was aided by the convening power of universities. Now, more than a half a century later, this commission is working through the difficult issues requiring national investments in research and software development and new approaches on how to, among other things, apply AI uh, appropriately for national security missions, attract and hold onto the best talent, protect and build upon technical uh, it advances, uh, best partner with our allies on AI, and stay ahead of the threat posed by this technology in the hands of our adversaries. 
and implement ethical requirements for responsible American-built AI. Indeed, last year, the Defense Innovation Board, which was also chaired uh, until recently by Dr. Schmidt, helped the department uh, begin the necessary uh, discussion on ethics in AI. Dr. Schmidt, I want to thank you for the four years that you led uh, the Defense Innovation Board, uh, and I look forward to working with you to make sure that uh, you continue to be able to serve uh, in some capacity with, uh, with the Defense Innovation Board. Uh, you're an invaluable resource, and we can't lose you. Uh, so I applaud the, uh, the Commission uh, for being um, uh, forward-leaning uh, by not only releasing an initial and annual report as required by law, but also releasing quarterly recommendations. Ranking Member Stefanik and I, along with Chairman Smith and Ranking Member Thornberry, were pleased to support a package of provisions uh, in this year's House version of the FY21 NDAA based on the Commission's uh, first uh, quarter's recommendations. The House version uh, carried 11 provisions, um, with the majority uh, der deriving from the Commission's call to strengthen the AI workforce. We are pleased that both Commissioner Griffiths and Commissioner Clyburn are with us uh, today to testify uh, the need for action uh, on, uh, on AI talent. On that note, we must implement policies that promote a sound economic, political, and strategic environment on U.S. soil where global collaboration, discovery, and innovation can all thrive. The open dialogue, in-depth, resident, in academia, and the research community can be an anathema uh, to the requirement for secrecy in the Department of Defense. But we must recognize and embrace how our free society provides the comprehensive advantage that lets uh, us innovate faster than our great power competitors. Our free society enables our dynamic innovation uh, uh, ecosystem and federally funded open basic research focused on discovery has allowed American universities to develop an innovation base that has effectively functioned as a talent acquisition program for the U.S. economy that is second to none. And that, uh, it, it, that talent is required today as much as ever to solve our most pressing national security challenges. Indeed, great power competition is also a race for talent. With that, uh, we're looking forward to hearing uh, uh, about your efforts and the observations and uh, recommendations you've already developed and your plan to continue until you submit the Commission's final report in the spring. Uh, with that, before turning to our witnesses, I'll now turn to Ranking Member Stefanik for her remarks. She has been an outstanding leader on the issue of AI. I've been proud to partner with her on this, uh, this whole effort, and uh, I like to now recognize Ranking Member Stefanik for her comments. Thank you, Chairman Langevin. Welcome to our witnesses, Chairman Schmidt, Vice Chairman Work, and Commissioners Clyburn and Griffiths. It's great to have you before the subcommittee today. Thank you for all of your continued service on this commission. I would be remiss if I didn't also thank Illy for his incredible work as staff director. I know we are working so closely with you, with our subcommittee staff and your team. On March 20th of 2018, I introduced legislation in the House of Representatives to establish a national commission to review the advances in artificial intelligence, the competitiveness of our efforts, and the implications to our national security. Just a year later, I had the honor of speaking at the AI Commission's first plenary session, meeting many of you and providing my thoughts on the importance and direction of the Commission's work. And just a few short months ago, I had the privilege of sponsoring, alongside my friend and colleague, Chairman Langevin, 11 amendments to the NDAA that originated from the Commission's first quarter recommendations. This is truly a remarkable achievement and demonstrates the value of your findings and recommendations to, to policymakers, and in particular to this committee. This impressive commitment reflects upon your hard work, the dedication of the staff, and also a recognition of how important and timely this conversation on artificial intelligence is to our national discourse and national defense. In my comments at the Commission's first session, I spoke about the need for artificial intelligence to be transformative. I stressed that if AI doesn't fundamentally change the way we operate, how we view our collective defense, adopt, adapt our workforce composition, shift our priorities, and invest our resources, then we are failing to embrace this new tech 
technology to its fullest. I am pleased that many of your initial recommendations addressed these issues, and I look forward to hearing your comments on how we are doing in these regards. Over the last several weeks, we've seen glimpses into the power of artificial intelligence. DARPA's Alpha Dog Fight demonstration, which pitted an experienced Air Force pilot in a virtual dogfight against an algorithm developed by a small woman and minority owned business in Maryland. It was a decisive victory for artificial intelligence and one that Secretary of Defense Esper accurately observed as a, quote, tectonic impact of machine learning on the future of war fighting. In another noteworthy demonstration, we observed a hypervelocity weapon shoot down a cruise missile with the help of an advanced battle management system powered by powerful data analytics and AI capabilities. The head of Northern Command noted afterwards, quote, I am not a skeptic after watching today. Equally important as these AI technical demonstrations is the formulation of policy governing how we use these capabilities, the development of standards, ethical principles, accountability, and appropriate level of human oversight will be critical to ensuring the American people trust its use. Your work, both on the commission and in your personal and professional endeavors, is key to ensuring a strong and enduring partnership between the military, academia, and private sector, a partnership built on trust, democratic ideals, and mutual value. Again, I look forward to discussing the Commission's recommendations and your priorities for the remainder of the Commission's work. Uh, thank you so much for your service and the hundreds of hours you've dedicated to this effort. I yield back. Thank you, Ranking Member Stefanik. Let me now introduce our, our witnesses. Uh, on the, uh, we're pleased to have with us today Dr. Eric Schmidt, Chairman of the National Security Commission on AI. Dr. Schmidt is the Technical Advisor uh, to the Board uh, of Alphabet, where he was formerly the Executive Chairman. His previous roles included the Chairman of Google, Inc., and CEO of Google. Uh, he has a, a distinguished record of contributions to the national security technology community, including uh, recently chairing the Defense Innovation Board. Dr. Schmidt, uh, as a, a commissioner on the Cyber State Surveillance Commission, I'd like to begin by thanking you for your commitment uh, to ensure the two commissions work closely together and all that you've done uh, to make the, uh, the AI Commission so robust. Uh, next, we'll hear from the Honorable Robert Work, Vice Chairman of the Commission. Secretary Work uh, is familiar, familiar to many of us as the uh, on the committee as the former deputy secretary of defense under the uh, and uh, the undersecretary of the navy before that secretary works commitment to innovative strategic thinking is well known uh, with his uh, related work on the third offset strategy thank you for being here uh, commissioner work next uh, we will hear from uh, the honorable mignon clyburn commissioner uh, clyburn has spent nine years on the Federal Communications Commission, where her commitment to closing the digital divide uh, was well known. She's had a distinguished career fighting uh, for diversity in the uh, in the communications sector. Thank you for being here as well, Commissioner Clyburn. And finally, uh, we have Dr. Jose Marie Griffiths. Dr. Griffiths is the president of South Dakota University. Dr. Griffiths, first of all, I want to thank you uh, again for hosting me and my fellow Solarian Commissioners two weeks ago uh, to release our, our white paper on the federal cybersecurity workforce. As you and I both know, our, our institutions of higher education are vital resources in educating the digital natives that we need to help us meet the AI and cybersecurity challenges that we will face in the, the coming decades. So with that, I again want to thank our witnesses for being here today. And I will turn now to uh, uh, Chairman Schmidt uh, to summarize your comments for five minutes. Chairman Smith, the, the, uh, the floor is now yours. <clears throat> Thank you so much. I cannot express how grateful I am for the leadership of Chairman Langevin, Ranking Member Stefanik, this commission, and the things that, that I, and, I and our commission care so deeply about. Uh, it, it has been a remarkable year working with you all to try to get these things going forward. The progress we've made in terms of um, improving the situation of AI, of AI is a good indicator of what is possible if we continue to work very hard on this. 
I cannot say enough how important this is. I think addressing AI <clears throat> in the way that we're describing is a unifying topic. It is a bipartisan priority. What's more important than our national security? And when I hear that, I say, what's more important than leadership in AI? Um, I can go on and on and on to, to the point of boredom, I suspect, of how AI is so exciting. I imagine if I were a graduate student today, the kind of amazing technologies and solutions I'd be able to provide using these new AI techniques that did not exist when I was a computer scientist as a young, younger scientist. In particular, the application to biology and to medicine and to health and to the things that we all care and, and deal with so much in our society. Um, th there's a term in, in uh, history called the Cambrian Explosion, and it's a point in history where everything came together to form modern life. And everything aligned at that point, and we're in a similar position now with AI. Um, these AI applications will be the basis for the solution to the COVID pandemic. I believe that, for example, the vaccines, essentially all the ones I've looked at have had AI as a core part of their research enterprise. I can just go on and on. Um, maybe it'll help us plan how to allocate the horrible fires and, and the resources. There, there are so many areas where we struggle where these new techniques can make us more effective and efficient. We have to understand, however, that there are darker sides of this technology. And in particular, I'll give you an example, something I'm concerned a lot about. Uh, AI systems are trained from human behavior. Humans have biases. And we don't, we're Americans, we don't believe in prejudice and bias. And so we have to work on that. And indeed, this is a large area of, um, uh, a large area of research. Uh, face recognition, for example, is full of biases that are incompatible today anyway, and, uh, with the sort of rules of America. Um, but I'm, I'm also concerned, and I want to hit this very hard, that uh, the AI system, systems can be used in ways that really are counter to how you want our country to evolve. Um, it can supercharge adversaries' dis disinformation campaigns. Most of the disinformation campaigns that I've looked at have been done by large groups of uh, presumably poorly paid and badly managed Russians. Um, imagine when the same technology is used in scalable machine learning at a scale that's much more pervasive. Um, it's very clear, and Bob uh, Work is an expert in this, that AI could lead to forms of autonomous warfare he will say, if you talk to him, that it's fine to make the weapons more, more effective, but that you, you fundamentally don't want automatic weapon systems that fire without human intervention. And indeed, our military has a rule of human in the loop for that reason. We already know that authoritarian regimes, uh, very incompatible with our democracy, are using AI technologies to try to consolidate power and homogenize thought and homogenizing thought gives you an army of sycophants, and the, the rest is history. Um, and certainly the technologies that are being broadly distributed now could distribute this to terrorists and the future Osama bin Ladens and sort of groups that we just don't want access to those. The other thing that's happening, and in my work with the military, I learned from them that uh, they now view a very strong strategic com competition with China as is on our plate. And I would argue that, that uh, China is no longer a near peer. They're a peer in this area. They're close enough. And the commission spent a lot of time discussing this. How close is it? But from my perspective, within a year or two, is close enough to be a serious issue. And there's no question that if the Chinese become leaders in AI, which in most cases they're not today, perhaps in TikTok's algorithm but not otherwise, uh, they're going to use it in ways that are inimical to our country's interests. So we've got to take this really seriously. Um, so we're going to basically make and continue to make strong recommendations to make AI for good. But I want to say right now that my approach, and I think the Commission's approach, is very straightforward. We want America to win. Right? It's really easy to articulate that way. We need to do whatever it takes with respect to AI to be leadership. One, one of you mentioned, why don't we just set a goal of leading, leading and winning sooner? I completely agree. Um, and, and part of the reason that we talked about ethics 
was because we want to win in a way that's compatible with American values, which you all know and you all embrace. So we've got a series of principles, which I'll, I'll highlight briefly. Um, we've got to be global leaders in AI. It's not okay if another country, specifically China, but there could be others, where they're the innovators ahead of us. Why is this so important? And we can explore this if you're interested in it. Because AI is a new knowledge and reasoning system, it is at the beginning and of every new area of inquiry. So every new aspect of science, every new aspect of thought, every new aspect of, of every new thing, well, now we'll start with AI as a contributing accelerator with new data, new insights, and so forth. That's why it's a pervasive technology. It's not like a missile that just gets smarter. Everything gets smarter. It has enormous systems implications to what we're doing, and probably eventually to society as a whole. The, uh, and by the way, the government is important here. When I was a graduate student, I was funded by DARPA and the National Science Foundation. I wouldn't have been able to do it without that funding. I didn't have the money. This, the, the remarkable relationship that collectively you all established between universities, the private sector, and the federal government, primarily some state governments, is at the root of American exceptionalism in this area, and I want to keep it. Um, so so the, the, I cannot express the importance of federal funding and research and these sorts of things. Um, and, and we've talked about this before in this committee and subcommittee, and I think everyone understands that the federal government funds the research that nobody else can because it's not in their business interest. So there is a key role for federal, federal funding research. Adopting AI for national security, as uh, uh, Congresswoman Stefanik mentioned, is central. She used some examples uh, that are recent, but there are example after example after example in national security. Um, the most obvious ones involve uh, the, the uh, uh, intelligence committees, uh, community because they spend a great deal of time with data and AI is very good at sorting through data. I'd much rather get a heads up from a computer system that's constantly looking for threats and then I have a human say, oh, that's interesting, I hadn't thought about that, right? That's what AI can do, that will keep us safe. Um, this sort of, we've got to find ways, and we have some proposals where private sector individuals are flowing into and out of the government and vice versa. Right, the fact that that talent and knowledge is in the private sector, we need it in the federal government, and we need the federal government people in the private sector. We need to make that as easy as possible, and we have some recommendations there. Um, we're gonna talk a lot about talent today. The majority of the subsections of our recommendations so far have been talent. After a while, when you work on this, you discover that you can write as many papers as you want, but the fact of the matter is that without the people who understand, and this stuff is hard, be, to be very honest, a lot of it is really hard. I have a PhD in this area and it's hard for me, right? I can imagine what somebody who's trying to struggle through all the complexities. We need a next generation of talent and they need to be in the government, working for uh, the secretary of this and the secretary of that and the DOD and the, inter and the intelligence community and working for you all on your staffs and so forth. You need that. Um, we're gonna talk a lot about this, and in, indeed Mignon and, and uh, Jose, Jose Marie are, are, will go in in some detail. Um, we, we really want to emphasize that we wanna do this in an American way, free inquiry, free enterprise, and the free flow of ideas, right? The Chinese model is different, it's not compatible with the way we work, right? There are other models, let's do this the American way. Um, and you guys, by the way, did a really good job in terms of um, counterintelligence threat in research, uh, taking, in, taking action to protect uh, fields like mi microelectronics, which we're also very worried about. Right? So again, the, the government is beginning to understand this and beginning to act correctly. Um, what we need to do is we need, um, we need to get the eth ethics stuff in agreement. Um, I was part of a team that did a DOD ethics group. I was also part of a, a team in Google that did some ethics work. Um, there's an emerging consensus of what AI ethics looks like, and we, can we include that as part of our report. And then finally, I think we need to win all of the tech competitions, not just the AI ones, right? We've never had a challenger at the level of depth and sophistication that China represents in terms of their, her innovative capability. 
we need to take it seriously in terms of scale. Um, and I think, frankly, we should publish such a list. If you were to ask me today, I'd tell you the list of things that are important are AI, obviously, biotechnology, the basis for a gazillion dollars worth of industry, quantum computing, something which is hard to understand but incredibly important for national security, semiconductors, huge fight over that, 5G, very important, and advanced manufacturing, huge basis for industry in our, in our country. Uh, but maybe there are others on that list. And I think one of the things that, that we all should collectively discuss is what that li list should be. And again, let me just emphasize, this has to be all around, built around American values. And I'll finish up by saying that we've been working hard with you and your staffs to translate these into specific recommendations. What I've learned in this process is there's all sorts of rules that govern how pieces of the government work. You all knew this. And that if we can uh, adjust those rules to be a little bit more focused on getting excellent AI techniques, technologists, getting leadership, getting everybody talking to each other and all of that, the American model will not just succeed but really thrive. So I want to thank you so much uh, for letting me speak. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Schmidt. Uh, thank you for your leadership and uh, all the work you've done. Uh, to lead this commission and uh, give us a lot to, to think about. Um, with that, uh, the chair now recognizes the vice chair of the AI Commission, uh, the Honorable Robert Work. Uh, uh, Secretary, you're invited to uh, summarize your uh, remarks for five minutes. And without objection, your uh, written testimony will be submitted for the record. Secretary Work, you may have to unmute your, uh, your line. Sorry about that, sir. Uh, Chairman Langevin, Ranking Member Stefanik, and members of the committee, thanks for the opportunity to testify today. I'd like to discuss the importance of capitalizing on AI for our nation's defense and intelligence capabilities, and then discuss the commission's view on this year's National Defense Authorization Act in the current House and Senate versions. The commission has found that in important ways, and as Eric has laid out, AI is going to change how we defend the American homeland, how our intelligence agencies make sense of the world, and how our military deters adversaries and fights on future battlefields. In the context of homeland security, we see promise in applying AI to border protection, cyber defense, critical infrastructure protection, counterterrorism, and counterintelligence investigations. It will also be central to countering malign information operations designed to create or deepen fissures in our society and undermine confidence in the electoral process. In the intelligence realm, AI algorithms can sift through vast amounts of data to find patterns and identify correlations while automating imagery analysis and other labor intensive analytical tasks. For our military, AI enabled autonomous systems open up a vast new realm of possibilities for operational concepts and command decision making that will give us advantages in any fight. AI is going to enable new forms of what we call human machine collaboration, using machines to help humans make better decisions, and human machine combat teaming, both of which will improve combat effectiveness. If employed responsibly, we believe AI-enabled military systems can also help reduce risk to U.S. service members in the field and protect innocent lives abroad. In addition, AI will make business functions of the Department of Defense, the entire federal workforce for that matter, and sector far more efficient and cost effective. The Commission is preparing recommendations in all of these areas. We have moved with an urgency that is commensurate with the opportunity and the national security threat presented by AI. As you know, sir, we released our interim report last November that articulated a series of initial judgments of all of the commissioners. And we have published over 80 recommendations since. We'll publish more next month. We will deliver our final report to Congress and the president in March 2021. These are going to cover five key areas, research and development, national security applications, talent and workforce, promotion and protection of critical technologies, 
international partnerships and ethics. We have encouraged to see several of the commission's early recommendations reflected in both the House and Senate versions of this year's NDAA. And I want to comment on the importance of the legislative action in five key areas. The current bill encouraging uh, actions to bolster government investment in AI research and development, improve public private coordination and establish technical standards. The commission shares these priorities and endorses them and applauds them. We want to emphasize the importance of creating a national AI research resource. Right now we have an AI research have, haves and have nots. The haves are generally in the private sector and the have nots are in academia. We are very encouraged in the new recent White House led investments to establish seven national AI institutes. But we believe that the AI research resource would complement and support these efforts. In terms of defense, Department of Defense Organization reform, we've made several recommendations to make sure that DOD puts the proper emphasis on AI and shepherds and monitors the way it is transforming the force. Microelectronics, we need to preserve our leadership in this, and we have put forth several recommendations to lay the groundwork for long-term access to resilient, trusted, uh, and assured microelectronics. The fourth area is ethical and responsible use. We've spent a lot of time on this and Eric has talked about that, so I won't dwell on it anymore. And the fifth area is the federal government's AI workforce. I'm going to leave that up to, to discuss in detail. So let me just stress we must grasp the inevitability of AI and out innovate, out invest, out strategize, and outwit our competitors. I thank this committee so much for devoting so much attention to including the AIs and developing this year's NDAA. We're extremely encouraged to see this process, and we look forward to working with the committee in the future. Thank you. Very good. Secretary Work, thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, I understand the, the commissioners have, commissioners have uh, worked out among themselves that uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Jose Marie Griffiths will go next. So, uh, Dr. Griffiths, the, uh, the floor is now yours for you to summarize your testimony for five minutes. And without objection, your written testimony will be submitted for the record. Thank you very much, Chairman Langevin and Ranking Member Stefanik and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. Within our commission, I've chaired our efforts to develop an AI-ready federal workforce and to improve the AI talent pool in the United States more broadly. Over the last year and a half, our workforce line of effort has held 11 working groups and interviewed more than 150 AI and human capital experts from the government, private sector, and academia. Through this process, three broad themes have emerged about the government's workforce. First, building an AI-capable workforce doesn't lend itself to neat and tidy solutions. We need to tackle the problem from multiple angles. Second, it's difficult for agencies to implement their own major workforce reforms. Anything other than incremental change requires congressional leadership. And third, every opportunity my colleagues have mentioned and every challenge we describe in our report is, at its core, a workforce issue. When organizations fail to adopt AI, and it's almost always because of their lack of qualified engineers and lack of senior leaders with the right education and experience to establish priorities and cut through red tape. When organizations can't purchase the software and hardware they need, it's often due to a problem with the uh, limited knowledge and uh, understanding on the part of their acquisition and contracting personnel. When organizations struggle to collect and manage data, it often suggests a lack of training and education geared towards these complex tasks. To better understand the composition of the workforce the government needs, we partnered with the Defense Innovation Board and the Joint AI Center to create an AI workforce model which you can find in our interim report. In broad strokes, 
we believe the government should focus on five things. One, build a technical workforce with tiered levels of skill and educational requirements. Educate senior leaders who can better define strategic and enterprise objectives. Three, train junior leaders who will manage the deployment and use of AI-enabled technologies and capabilities. Four, train the end users of AI-enabled technologies who will be responsible for collecting and managing data. And five, train and educate people in critical support roles, including human resource, acquisition, contracting, and legal professionals. Our early recommendations are meant to help set a foundation for federal workforce improvements, and we're encouraged to see so many of them reflected in this year's NDAA. I'd like to highlight several provisions in particular that we strongly support. They include AI training courses for H excuse me, <coughs> HR professionals, the creation of unclassified workspaces, a pilot program for using electronic portfolios to evaluate applicants for technical positions, a program to track and reward the completion of AI training, a mechanism to hire university faculty on a part-time basis in government laboratories, expanding talent exchange programs between DOD and technology companies, and an adjustment to the aptitude test that the armed services use so that it tests for computational thinking skills. In combination, these reforms would mark a significant step forward, and I urge Congress to ensure they're included as part of this year's defense authorization. Thank you again for the op opportunity to appear here today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank, thank you very much, Dr. Griffiths. Uh, the, uh, the chair now recognizes uh, Commissioner Clyburn uh, for your testimony for five minutes. And uh, without objection, your written testimony will be submitted for the record. No objection. Thank you very much. Chairman Langevin, Ranking Member Stefanik, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I would like to use my time to continue the theme that my colleague, Dr. Griffiths, has just discussed, the state of the federal government's AI workforce. In my time on the commission, it has become clear to me that talent is the centerpiece of any winning AI strategy. We have examined the government's current shortcomings and have found that in addition to the series of reforms Dr. Griffith mentioned, we need to take bolder action. Existing programs will not bring enough digital talent into the public service workforce to meet serious shortages. The current scholarship and service programs are limited in scale and will not create a common set of ideas, shared experiences, professional culture, or a common mission to improve the government's digital talent. So we must fundamentally reimagine the way you, the U.S. government recruits and builds its digital workforce. The Commission has put forward two significant proposals and I will take these few minutes that I have left to briefly describe them. First, we propose building a United States Digital Service Academy. This academy will produce technically educated graduates who would have a service obligation as civil servants in the federal government. The academy will be an independent entity within the government. It will be advised by an interagency board which would be assisted by a federal advisory committee composed of commercial and academic leaders in emerging technology. The academy would be a partnership between public and private sectors, working together toward a common goal of developing a modern, digitally proficient workforce. We should consider now, before legislative action takes place, how the private sector and academia can support an academy. We are eager to discuss what barriers, limitations, or other factors would prevent such cooperation or work with legislators to ensure that language is written with this partnering in mind. Second, we propose establishing a National Digital Reserve Corps. Many of the most talented technologists in the United States 
are eager to serve their country, but are unlikely to become full-time government employees or military reservists. The government needs a mechanism to tap this talent reservoir. The government should establish a National Reserve Digital Corp modeled after the military reserves that allow civilians to work for government 38 days a year as advisors, instructors, and developers. We could incentivize participation with a training and education fund and a scholarship program modeled after ROTC. While short-term volunteers are not a substitute for full-time employees, they can help improve AI education for both technologists and non-technical leaders, perform data triage and acquisition, help guide projects and frame technical solutions, build bridges between the public and private sector, and other important tasks. I urge members of Congress to take both of these proposals into consideration and to develop the legislation that would be needed to turn bold ideas into real institutions and programs. Thank you again for the opportunity to share our recommendations with you, and I look forward to any questions you may have. Very good. Thank okay. you, Commissioner Clyburn. I want to thank all of our witnesses here today for your extraordinary contributions to the National Security Commission on AI. We appreciate the uh, testimony today and your written testimony that you've submitted. And uh, we'll now turn to rec recognizing members for questions for five minutes, uh, beginning with myself. Um, let me start with you, if I could, uh, Chairman Schmidt. Um, uh, given that, uh, that, that China views talent as central to its technological advancement, uh, U.S. policies that restrict foreign talent from studying and working in the U.S. seem to play right into uh, China's hands. How do uh, policies that restrict China's talent uh, from studying and working in the U.S. Uh, impact our national security? Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was um, quite surprised when we looked at the quality of the top papers how many Chinese graduate students were part of the top papers being produced in the United States. So in other words, if you were to get rid of them, if you were to say none of them are allowed in the U.S., U.S. research would suffer. Um, I, I don't know if it's appropriate or not, but I, I need to say that this uh, Pathway Act that uh, you guys are proposing is exactly a good answer to this because we need to identify the very tip-top people we need for national security from all countries, and we need to get them into America, and we need to keep them here. And we need to keep them here producing research wins, producing defense companies, producing high-tech companies, and so forth and so on. Uh, put another way, if those people are using China as an example, if they're in China, they're going to start up a whole bunch of com companies that are going to become a real pain in the ass, if, I, if it's okay to say that for the Congress in a decade. So in other words, I'd much rather have them creating huge successes in America for security and also for commercial reasons than doing the same thing in China or another country such as Russia, and then us having to deal with the consequences of that. And just to make it clear, uh, if you look at TikTok, the, the core achievement of TikTok, although it's a social phenomena, is a different kind of AI recommendation algorithm where they're clearly ahead. The moment we started uh, arguing with TikTok over their U.S. operations, the Chinese government banned the export of that algorithm. How important is that? I don't know. But it's a good example of something that would have been available to U.S. researchers that is not available today. That is not a good thing. Thank you. I, I share your concern. And uh, the Pathways uh, Act uh, is a... Uh, is a good remedy, again, allowing the Secretary of Defense to designate uh, critical uh, study areas uh, where we'd want to keep that talent here. We start out with 10 individuals, but uh, we would like to very much like to rapidly expand it to a, a larger number from there. Um, next question, what are uh, any uh, specific AI research areas in which you believe uh, the United States is under or overinvested? And how would you propose rebalancing U.S. science and technology investments? So um, my personal opinion, uh, people can d dis disagree over this, is that we're not over-invested in anything. Um, 
it's clear that we're underinvested in uh, the underlying infrastructure that is needed. Uh, there is a proposal that is, I think, being discussed uh, in the Congress called the National AI Research Resource. Um, and the idea here is it's, it's a good idea. It's basically to try to create an infrastructure that allows all of the creative people in the United States access to the systems where they can do the research. I can tell you that if you work in a very large company, you have that. But what about all the 10-person and 20-person companies where they don't have the money and the scale and the time to get the kind of data and data analysis and computing platforms? What about the researchers, the, the three people in you know, a little boat somewhere in, in their uh, university who don't have access, but they have a brilliant idea? One of, the, one of the hallmarks of American creativity has been that the greatest things come from the weirdest corners. We want to make sure that those weird corners in the United States of sort of clever people who are staying up all night drinking Diet Coke and eating hamburgers, whatever the stereotype you have is, they have the tools that they need to do global solutions very quickly. Thank you. Uh, and uh, understanding that many of your recommendations are focused on government-wide, uh, what are the other uh, committees that you're you're meeting with to help implement these provisions? Uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the committees of the Congress? That's right. Yeah. What what there? What other uh, committees of the Congress are you meeting with to help implement these these provisions? In general, this area on our, our remit is controlled by the Hask and the Sask. Okay. All right, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank uh, you very much, Mr. Chairman. If I could yes. add, sure, we have, we've worked very closely with the intelligence committees on several of the uh, recommendations, as well as. <clears throat> the operators, and any, uh, any of the areas that have to do with workforce, uh, we try to reach out to as many committees that uh, oversee the government workforce, for example. So I know, Ili Bajraktari, we can take that as a question for the record, sir, and bring it back to you, but we are talking with many of the committees. Very good. Thank you very much. Uh, I have an additional question, but uh, I'm going to stop there, and I'll now yield to Ranking Member Stefanik. Uh, for her question. Thank you, Jim. Um, I wanted to follow up on um, Eric's comments regarding the infrastructure side. So the commission referenced many times the importance of accessible, robust data sets for the development of machine learning and AI. However, we often hear and we've worked through many of these impediments um, within DOD, whether it be classified or controlled data sets from the government side, or concerns that exist over intellectual property and data rights from the side of private industry that, of course, partners with DOD. How specifically would the commission suggest AI stakeholders alleviate these concerns and reduce those impediments? Because I view that as a form of the infrastructure. The data sets are the fuel for AI, and this is a really tough challenge for us to work through. Maybe Commissioner Work can, can also add to this. Uh, when I look at this, what I would like to see is a broad research exemption that would allow the kind of data that is being collected to be used for research with appropriate safety safeguards and privacy concerns and so forth. Um, one of the key things to understand about AI is it needs data. It eats data, right? It's how it trains, it's how it learns. And the more data, the better. There are a number of problems in AI which seem to only get better with more data. There's no limit to the amount of data you can, you can feed them. Language translation and language understanding is such an example. And so the combination of the computing resource that I've highlighted plus broader access to data under appropriate safeguards is key. Each of, the, each of the groups that controls this has got to confront the fact that they have a lot of data that's in databases that are not connected together, that nobody knows how to get it out, and so forth. I believe for a long time that if that using intelligence as an example in the intelligence community, if they could simply unify their databases, you'd find an enormous number of new things because the data is over here and not there, and the AI can see the pattern between the two that humans cannot. Uh, Bob, could you add a little bit here? Well, I think I can start by adding a real life uh, anecdote, uh, Congressman Stefan uh, Congresswoman Stefanik. Uh, when we set up Project Maven, 
which was designed to sort through all of the full motion video and take analysts away from the screen, staring at the screens for hours upon hours and having the computer work that data. Jack Shanahan, Lieutenant General Shanahan, who was that time the head of the ISR, the Intelligence Surveillance and Reconnaissance Task Force, came to me and said, we can't do what you wanna do, Mr. Secretary, because the data that we need to train the algorithms is all classified secret. And uh, I said, so what do we have to do about it? And he said, all you have to do is declassify it. So I just asked, okay, what would be the implications? And it turns out that it was very easy to do and it had absolutely no impact on security in the sense of us giving up any type of uh, secrets. So to your point, I believe that the Jake and the new chief data officer need to have the authority to declassify data when asked to uh, use for an AI algorithm. They are the ones that are in the position to determine whether or not declassification of the data would pose any risk to the department and it would make it faster and uh, easier uh, to go after these AI algorithms. Thank you, yield back. Thank you, Elise. Um, next, uh, Mr. Larson is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate that. Um, Chair Schmidt, earlier in your testimony, and we were talking earlier, um, I'd ask you uh, whether or not we should make a similar decla declaration on AI policy that the Chinese government has made, where they're going to be the, the global leader in AI by 2030. And I always thought, well, we'll just say that we're going to be the global leader by 2029. We're just going to beat them to that. Um, why don't we, and what would prevent us from doing that? I, I think the... Uh, uh, your question was very prescient in, in, in my view because I, I, the good news is I think we already are the global leader and we need to maintain it. So I would recommend that the Congress come up with some mechanism to say where we must lead. Um, there's a candidate list. Indeed, in one of the bills you've proposed, you've made a list which is similar to, it's a biotechnology list, 5G, so forth and so on. I view these as a matter of national security, national priority. They're also at the basis for the economy of America, right? So the most valuable companies in the United States are all based on these technologies. We don't want to give up that either. So it, even if you don't care about national security, you must care about our, our companies and our economic growth and the GDP and the wealth of our citizens. So regardless of your point of view, right, I know you care about both, you're going to want a, a, a plan. And uh, what I would recommend is that you ask us to produce the list. Um, and we'll work with our colleagues and the other commissions and come back to you um, and for your consideration. Uh, and if we, were, if we ma made that ask, uh, could you still do that within the timeline of the, of the commission? Um, we have a team looking at this question. I'm sure we could do a good first start. I would also say that these sorts of lists are, they're one, they're controversial within the community because people are fighting for their own fiefdoms. But there's also- We don't, we don't have that here, so oh, fine. Of course. <laughs> but in, in the technical <laughs> world, these battles occur. But also, there's evidence that America's greatness is because of our ability to integrate these things quickly. So it's not only the areas, but our ability and the flexible way in which we work as a society to create the companies, create the initiatives, create the research, and, and create the health solutions and so forth, combining them. So I would recommend that not only do we, we give you something that's interesting for your review, but then you also ask in some other forum for a continual review of this. I think it's part of national security. Okay. Uh, on Monday, the DOD released their AI education strategy, which was uh, directed in Section 256 of the fiscal year 2020 NDAA. It's really focused more on educating the women and men who wear the uniform in the DOD uh, about the basics of AI and how it might apply in, their, in, in everything that they do. Has the commission evaluated that 
uh, would you, and would you evaluate it? Let me ask uh, Mignon and Jose. Uh, go ahead. Sure, I'll, I'll ask Commissioner Clyburn. Yeah. Oh. Uh, the short answer is, is yes, sir. Uh, we recognize that uh, without talent, uh, without pathways inside and outside of of, of the communities, of, of that, that that all will be troubled. <laughs> I'll just I'll put it that way. So we have outlined, um, especially uh, in our first uh, quarter recommendations, a, a series of uh, pathways, of opportunities, of synergies uh, that should be uh, realized and adopted across. Uh, multiple platforms, in, in, in including uh, recognizing and affirming um, AI as a priority, no matter what your rank, uh, no matter what your job description. So that holistic, inclusive approach to learning uh, and embracing um, AI as a way of life, as a, a, a way of your job, as a way of this mission, as a national uh, strategic priority uh, is, 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 is a is definitely, you will see that all through uh, this report, sir. Th thank you, thank you. And uh, I wanna move though to a final question. Uh, Chair Schmidt, you, you, you know Kai-Fu Lee, I imagine. I do very well. Yeah, in his 2018 book on AI and superpowers, um, he made a distinction between the United States being better at innovation with the, and where the Chinese uh, system is better at application of AI. Do you? Um, agree with that assessment, and if you agree with that assessment, maybe for the record, you can get back to us how we could we could be better in both. Um, so Kai Fu and I have have been colleagues and friends for a decade, and um, my view of his book was that it was the case for China. I think we don't really know if his claims are correct, but the argument that he made that's important to state right here and right on the record is that they have a massive investment in this area coming, and we know that there are areas where um, the application of this technology is a scale problem. In other words, we invent it and they apply it. And I am always worried that we're going to do something that will prevent us from having a global market. Uh, part of the genius of America is our, our companies are global companies, so they have a huge market, right? And I want to make sure that that's, that's a huge market and not taken over by China. So I'm worried about what he says. Uh, we can try to give you more clarity on some of the things that you can do. Uh, many of them are more are broader than our mission. So many of them involve um, essentially promoting entrepreneurship, uh, trying to get more dynamism in the economy, trying to get more founders to found the great companies, uh, more, more high skills immigration, uh, trade policy, which promotes uh, American exports. I, I suspect these are things that you would agree with, but it, that's sort of the list. Yeah, all right. Thank you. Uh, I apologize, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. Thank you, Mr. Arson. Uh, Mr. Conaway is now recognized for five minutes. I'll just note, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Conaway is not present at this point. Uh, okay, is Mr. Bacon there? Uh, Mr. There are no Republicans present at this, at this point, so it would be the next uh, next in line, the Democrat next in line. Sorry, sorry, Mr. Okay, then uh, we'll take the Republicans when they come back. Uh, next will be uh, Ms. Slotkin is recognized for five minutes. Great. Thank you, Chairman. Um, great to see you both. Thank you for coming. Um, you know, I was reading through the recommendations of the, the various quarters, um, and I, I think there's nothing to... Um, you know, contradict anything. You guys are the experts in this, but I think for former Deputy Secretary Work and for uh, Mr. Schmidt, head of the Defense Innovation Board, we always have these commissions, but the structure at the Department of Defense does not support an easy, efficient incorporation of new technology, not for any one person's fault, but because of the incentive structure there. Um, and so while I see a lot of suggestions, I, I'm having trouble understanding how to incorporate this in a way that's practical. So from each of your perches, one in the DIB and one as DEPSECDEF, can you talk about the structural change that no kidding, no joke would allow for this innovation to be incorporated and not just repeating the past of the services being able to do their own kind of decision making on this um, and only a notional kind of sign off at the top level 
that misses the real opportunities. And I'll turn to Mr. Schmidt first. Uh, well, actually, why don't we, if, if, if with of your course. permission, could we have uh, Chairman uh, of, Work speak first? Of course. Follow him. It's good to see you again, Representative Slotkin. Good Slocken. to see you. Uh, uh, I could imagine you asking me this question in my office. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, you're exactly right. Uh, on a transformation of the scale that the commission believes is necessary, just how important artificial intelligence will be not only to the business applications in the department, but more importantly, the operations and combat capability and effectiveness of the department, you're going to have to have a strong top-down push. Uh, you're going to want to have the thousand flowers bloom within the services. That's going to be a very good thing to see, and I actually think that's happening now. But without that st uh, strong top-down push, you're not going to get the broadest uh, transformation that you're looking to. The commission talked about this a lot and came down with two things. One, I think you remember the old advanced capabilities and deterrence panel. Yeah. And using that as an exemplar, we said we should have a steering group, a technological steering group, consisting of the deputy secretary, uh, the um, vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the principal deputy director of national intelligence, the assistant sec uh, the undersecretary of defense for research and engineering. And they would try to look at the forest instead of the trees and approach it the way that Eric talked about. How do you integrate all of these technologies for military advantage? And without someone doing that on a consistent basis, you're not going to have the transformation that you would otherwise have. The second thing is we feel strongly now that the Secretary of Defense has come out and said that AI is if not the top priority, one of the top three priorities and put it underneath the Secretary of Defense, who could then delegate it to the deputy uh, if he or she so desires. Um, the CIO, we believe, should be responsible for the broader digital transformation of the department. It makes sense to have things like the cloud and the data strategy and the infrastructure that uh, Eric talked about. The CIO is natural for that job. But we need to have a single organization that is focused on applications, like a laser beam. And in our view, the CIO shouldn't lead that effort. It should come directly from the top, be top-down driven, and the executive agent for that should be the Jake. The combination of the technical steering group, which is looking at the forest rather than the trees, and then the Jake, which is helping to plant and tend to the trees, is the way we think that you can have this be a sustaining transformation. Great. And Chairman Schmidt, in the last 30 seconds of my time. Um, I guess I should have realized that the military would be top down. <laughs> and it's so top down. Everything that Bob just said is a requirement. I would add one more thing if I were advising the Secretary of Defense. I would just say, I want everything faster. I want these prototypes faster. I want to design engineering mechanism where I get stuff faster. These product cycles for weapon systems, which are 15 years, are crazy because the technology has already moved past what the spec was. It doesn't serve our nation well. Totally. Let's get to a different model where the stuff is happening very quickly. We're canceling and starting things. We're giving you all choices of things to approve and so forth. The proposal that Bob made is very consistent with that. But I would tell you the metric I would apply if I were Congress is I want things faster. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Ms. Larkin. Uh, Mr. Brown is going to recognize five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank uh, Chairman Schmidt and all of the commissioners for your work uh, on this commission in the area of artificial intelligence. Thank you for being here today. Uh, I'm enthusiastic about um, the uh, the opportunities, the potential for artificial intelligence, particularly how it's going to enhance not only the lethality but the survivability of our warfighters. I think about autonomous vehicles, air, land, and sea. Um, I think about enhanced uh, human decision-making. 
Um, I think about um, uh, improved targeting, which is so important, particularly with the, you know, the ever-increasing number of se sensors in, in the various physical domains on the battlefield. Uh, but I, I do have some concerns. I have some concerns uh, that you've mentioned, um, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, and that has been a topic of conversation, and that is biases uh, in both the development and, event and the deployment of AI, biases by culture, race, ethnicity, and even gender. Um, and I'm concerned, particularly when we're talking about AI for targeting, whether that targeting is done by the military uh, or by law enforcement. Uh, NIST, in a study, I think last year, uh, found that um, African American and Asian faces, we're talking about facial recognition in, 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 in targeting, identifying, 10 to 100 times more likely to be falsely identified than Caucasian. Um, now, the, the, the second quarter recommendations uh, did include the following. It said, R&D is needed to advance capabilities of AI technologies to perceive and understand the meaning of human communication, including sp spoken speech, written texts, and gestures. This research should account for varying languages and cultures with special attention to diversity, given that AI typically performs worse in cases in gender and racial minorities. So there's a recognition of this. Um, you probably know that um, of the $4.1 billion that the DOD invests in research and development at university and colleges, less than 0.5% uh, goes to historically black colleges and universities and minority serving institutions. So I have a concern about the bias in the development and deployment, and I have the, a concern about the lack of diversity and inclusion to address the bias. And nowhere in the first quarter interim report that you issued or the commission issued um, uh, did I hear um, much of anything about diversity and inclusion. So what are we doing to ensure that as we are considering and studying and developing and deploying um, AI in all of its many ways that we're addressing biases, and in my opinion, you do that by making sure you have a diverse and inclusive team that is actually researching and developing and delivering this technology. What are we doing now? What should Congress do uh, to, to, to move this along faster? Speaking for the commission, we completely agree with the framing that you just said and the issues, and they're starkly correct. Uh, let me ask the fellow commissioners to comment on the solutions. I can tell you that this is a huge issue in the American research institutes, universities. Many, many people have ethics groups and concerns over bias. Uh, in, there may be algorithmic ways to change the algorithms to eliminate this bias in such a way that we don't have to worry about it as much. But right now, it's a very real issue. Um, Mignon and uh, Jose Marie. Um, I, I, I'm happy to start. Um, there, were, there were really two answers to the question. One relates to how we build the AI algorithms to eliminate bias and how we make sure and test against all different uh, scenarios that the bias doesn't exist. The other goes back to workforce again, and to have a broadly diverse and inclusive workforce that represents um, the, the, the population of the nation, um, that becomes very, very important as well. I believe um, it, was, uh, it was GM that first uh, brought women in to design minivans for the soccer moms, and the design of those vehicles suddenly became very different. So I think uh, at two ends, one is the R&D and the actual algorithm development, testing and evaluation. And on the other side, trying to ensure that we have the broadest possible representation coming into the workforce, which relates to actually some of the work that we're doing for our next report, which relates to um, looking not just at the, uh, the universities and their production of, of graduates in AI and increasing those numbers, but actually reaching down into K through 12 and also looking at alternative pathways into the workforce that go beyond the college degree. So uh, we're looking at those things um, at both levels. And I think, Mignon, you may have something you wish to add here too. Right. One of the reasons, Congressman, I mentioned um, the uh, two proposals that would uh, encourage and bolster uh, a diverse set, diverse sets of talent, including civilian talent, is when it comes to the development, when it comes to those teams, they have to be inclusive. They have to be diverse. Uh, when models uh, 
are designed, um, it there has to be an inclusive and expanded table. That is the problem. You know, one of the things, and I know I'm running out for your minutes. I, I came firsthand a few years ago. I went in um, with this, you know, AI enabled uh, a, a product, and it didn't see my face at all. I was invisible in a room. So if I'm invisible, that was a kind of passive invisibility, but invisibility in terms of presence, in terms of, you know, being able to um, not only see, but uh, predict in a, a productive way. If that is not at the design phase, uh, then we're going to have a perpetual problem at the implementation phase. So they have has to be inclusive, has to be diverse, um, and we have to be conscious and intentional uh, about uh, production and application. Mr. Chairman, and yielding back, if I could just uh, comment that last year's NDAA, uh, we directed the Secretary of Defense to commission a study, the National Study of Defense Research at HBCUs, in an effort to increase the research dollars and the cap capacity, capability. I would commend and request that, that this commission uh, take a look at that work. They're at the very early stages and perhaps provide them guidance and input on how we can get more research dollars in those universities and colleges where you have a high concentration of diverse uh, candidates doing e extraordinary things at the graduate and undergraduate level. Um, and AI may very well be a part of that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you for your indulgence. And that's a yes. Thank, thank you, Mr. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Certainly a very important topic to raise. Uh, with that, Ms. Trahan is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I really appreciate the uh, the expertise represented in this commission uh, and the depth of your recommendations uh, laid out in the in the Q1 and Q2 reports. Um, I think my question um, is for Commissioners uh, Griffiths and Clyburn. Um, I'm interested in just digging deeper into your line of effort on AI talent. Uh, there seems to be a severe lack of AI knowledge in the DOD and other parts of government, or that you know AI requirements and capabilities get automatically bundled uh, with cyber missions. And so, one, it would be great if you could just um, explain why it's important to decouple our AI workforce uh, from the cyber workforce and. Then also here, um, how how you would recommend the government create a system for measuring and uh, and tracking uh, its AI knowledge? Um, I'll, I'll jump in if I may. Um, you're you're absolutely right. Um, I think that uh, decoupling cyber cyber from AI is very important because cyber has a mission. It is very, very clear what the mission of cyber is. And while they may have common roots and fundamentals of computer science, they branch off after that and focus on different missions. And confusing them confuses everyone. Um, I, from an academic perspective, our academic programs are very different uh, for producing graduates in those areas. Um, so I think decoupling is one, and we've made recommendations not for eliminating one or crowding out a program in cyber, but actually adding to the vehicle or adding to the mechanism to ensure that AI receives appropriate attention as well as cyber. On the issue of um, the talent base within the government, um, you have no ways at the moment of knowing who has the talent and who doesn't have the talent. You don't even really know in the military who has capabilities of coding. And so a number of our recommendations are addressed to um, sort of testing for what we call computational thinking, which now is the, the prevailing thought, the kind of uh, capability and underlying fundamental skills and, and mindset that people have, the talent that they have, that can then be developed into um, our AI-related um, capabilities. So, um, the, and the other area is, of course, a lot of education and training at different levels. And our work for the workforce model that we developed jointly with the DIB and the Jake, I think, really address all those different layers. We have three very technical work roles and four non technical work roles, and all of them need to have some and different levels of understanding of AI, including ethical issues associated with the acquisition and application of AI. And I'll just uh, finish up by saying AI will continue to transform. It is not passive, and nor should we, be, you know, should be passive in terms of our intent 
in terms of it being a single focal line of effort, in, 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 if I may borrow um, our, our jargon, uh, so to speak. And, and, th and this general purpose technology has multiple uh, uh, applications that are significant uh, with, uh, with our focus when it comes to uh, you know, national security, uh, but it has a, a, a ripple effect throughout society. So uh, not targeting, not streamlining, you know, not um, separating, so to speak, um, would be to our peril uh, because of the expansive, the significance and how much is interwoven into our everyday lives. Um, I appreciate, um, appreciate that. Uh, and, you know, if I have time for just, well, I think I do have time to slip this last question, but, you know, we hear all the time that, you know, we're not recruiting enough technical uh, talent, and certainly we're not moving at the speed uh, that we need to. Um, uh, and our onboarding authorities are often uh, not able to meet the de the demand. Uh, you address some of these concerns um, in the in your quarter. In, I think it was the Q1 uh, recommendations around strengthening the AI workforce and using a, a cyber accepted service. I'm wondering if, you know, whenever we have folks from the private sector, you know, uh, in front of us, we'd always love to, you know, borrow your best practices uh, in terms of specific recommendations the government should consider to be more competitive in recruiting this technical talent, knowing full well that some of the most competitive companies with the largest market share across the globe don't tip it, you know, they don't necessarily pay the, the most. Um, are there anecdotes that you can share with us on how we can think of novel ways of recruit, recruiting technical uh, talent more quickly. Uh, this is Eric, may I answer your question? Um, Please. The, in my service to the DOD for the four years I was as, uh, chairman of the DIB, I was struck by how many people want to volunteer to serve their nation and they're willing to do so at very low salaries um, and under lots of, lots of difficult situations. The things that drive them crazy are things like it takes three months to get an offer out, right? Or that they get classified in the wrong way, or they can't, they have to have five minutes per day to clean up their email because they only have a megabyte of email and their email system doesn't work. So they're willing to serve at a lower income level for the nation, but it's got to work operationally. And there are many such simple things that the DOD and others could do. It's true of the federal government in general. Great. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for indulging me. I obviously yield back. Thank you, Ms. Trahan. Uh, the Chair now recognizes Ms. Wuhan for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to all of the witnesses. Uh, and I just have some questions for any of you. Uh, the commission specified a belief that the Jake should be elevated from its current position with the CIO to a direct report to the secretary. And it notes that the secretary can delegate responsibility to the deputy secretary. The recommendation, however, does speak to your position that AI is an issue that has to be raised in order to, and this is a quote from the report, provide the requisite level of senior oversight and support needed to preserve the department's initial AI projects, enable their growth, and ensure that the department can de de develop the capabilities needed to successfully adopt AI applications. So the secretary and the deputy secretary have the ability uh, right now to take such a step today. However, they haven't acted on that recommendation to date, necessitating legislative involvement on the House's side in our most recent NDAA. So my question is, can you all help us understand potentially the reason that the department has not accepted your recommendation? And can you potentially reiterate for us the reasons why our colleagues on the Senate side should be interested in accepting the commission's position that the Jake should be placed under the secretary? Secretary's direct authority. Bob, can you comment on that? Yes, ma'am. Um, the Jake, uh, I think right now, is starting to hit its stride. Uh, Dana DC, who is the current CIO, is extraordinarily capable public servant. And the Jake has grown up under his uh, supervision. And I think the Department of Defense is quite happy uh, with the way things are progressing, as they should be. Uh, what the commission was thinking is that over time, the uh, CIO, you should split 
the responsibility where the CIO focuses on the digital transformation of the department, things like getting the cloud set up and settled, uh, doing the uh, data strategy for the department and focused on all of the infrastructure and having the Jake focus really like a laser beam on AI applications. At some point, someone is going to have to be designated kind of the system architect for large DOD programs. And the system architect would say, these are the AI applications that we think would have the broadest and the most consequential impact on the joint enterprise. And so we think that having the Jake doing that and having everybody in the services understanding that they're working under the direct supervision of either the secretary or the deputy secretary, that that is the fastest way to get transformation. Uh, so, sir, so that I think is sir, what you said was you that recommended that over time, and then you ended by saying that's the fastest way. And so, um, which, what is the timeline that your recommendation is, or is it the best to be immediately, you know, rip the Band-Aid and, and, and move forward? What is the recommendation in terms of timeline and, and immediacy? Um, I think I can speak for the commission uh, where we said, the sooner you do this, the better. Split the responsibilities, really start to run. As Eric said, uh, we believe that urgency and scale is absolutely important. So the sooner you would do something like this, we think the better. Okay, so urgency, sooner the, re the better. Do you all have anything else that you'd like to contribute to that uh, response? Well, so uh, we're celebrating the success of the Jake today. Two or three years ago, there were people who didn't want to do it at all. And it took, again, top town leadership from the Secretary of Defense at the time to really force it. If you want to take a large bureaucracy and reform it, uh, in, in a way that's consistent with national security and modern principles, you have to force it from the top. This is a maneuver of that nature. There are probably others. No, I appreciate that. I had the opportunity to visit the Jake, and I do understand how innovative it is and how uh, impossible the lift is from an organization as big as the DOD to create something new and innovative. Uh, I only have 24 seconds with my time, so I think I will yield back, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Wilhelm, and we're, we're going to go to a second round anyway, so if you want to ask another question, you'll have another opportunity. Um, uh, so I understand uh, Elise has not returned yet, uh, but hopefully she'll be back soon. Um, so I just had uh, two additional questions. I want to as well thank uh, our witnesses again as we go to a second round. Uh, my first question is, what are the most significant gaps in current legislation that relate to artificial intelligence and national security? And what do you believe uh, are the commission's most consequential recommendations that Congress has not yet acted upon? Um, maybe each of the commissioners could answer your question, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my reaction yes. is that the profound change that's needed is the workforce one that without addressing the workforce one, the gains will be lost in the bureaucracy, et cetera. Other commissioners? Investment, sir. Uh, it, 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 this will not um, be a, a, a free uh, a endeavor, uh, but it is one that is a priority. It is one that is critical. And so honestly, uh, right now I would say uh, budgetary. Uh uh, if I may, um, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I believe that um, I, I endorse what Eric said. I believe workforce is the core. As we've discussed at our various commission meetings, workforce has an impact on every other line of effort, um, and it needs to be done, and incremental changes are not going to make a difference. So we do need to make sort of moves that generate and, and lift the scale up so that we can uh, get, get the workforce ready quickly to enable some of the innovations to move forward quickly. I, I agree with my colleagues that workforce is number one. The national AI research resource, I think would be a close second, uh, along with the in, increases in investments as Mignon has talked about. 
the recommendations we've made on microelectronics and how we maintain our lead in that area, I think are extraordinarily consequential. Uh, and then the recommendations we make as far as pursuing with our allies this together, since we see very clearly that this is a competition in values as much as it is a competition in technology. And we want to involve all like-minded democratic nations so that AI reflects the values of democratic nations with respect for personal privacy, rule of law, et cetera. Uh, so I would put those four as very close together, but with workforce on top. Thank you, Secretary of Work. And that, that leads uh, into a good segue into my, my last question. Uh, obviously, as you pointed out, you know, we are not developing AI in a vacuum. Uh, other nations, uh, both competitors or adversaries, enemies, are also developing uh, AI technology. And they may not uh, uh, be approaching it with the same type of safeguards that we are putting in place to make sure that AI is used ethically and responsibly. Uh, what do we do about that? How do we protect ourselves against it? You know, what is the, uh, the, the way forward uh, to, to pressure other countries to respond to, to, to uh, approach use of AI uh, ethically and responsibly? So we do have some safeguards in place. Well, AI can be misused by countries that have different values than ours. Uh, the most obvious ones being the misuse of surveillance. And that to me is a political and nation state issue. Uh, the technology is already in China. They're gonna do what they're, whatever they're gonna do with it. I don't know how to stop that technically. Um, I think it's very important that if a technology is invented in America that is dual use and which could be used for very bad things, there be a moment of reflection as to whether that should be broadly released or kept more close for that reason. Thank you. Any other commissioner have a, a comment? I think the values need to be baked in. I uh, believe, um, as was mentioned, um, uh, those uh, the allies, the relationships, uh, the, 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 the norms uh, need to be socialized, agreed, um, and, and expanded robustly. I believe the strength in all of this um, you know, would lie in our principles and, and those ethical standards uh, uh, as we talk about efficiencies and all of the other uh, benefits. But the strength to me um, are, are the principles uh, that, um, that the U.S. and its allies uh, would, uh, I believe, promote and amplify. Has the U.S. Sir, this done is, anything uh, with respect to putting safeguards in place and use of AI? There was a little bit um, I, I heard. I, I don't think I. I know Secretary Work was going to uh, respond right. there. And I... Well, sir, on Monday, I just wanted to check on something because there was an extraordinary meeting uh, where 100 officials from 13 Democratic countries met online Tuesday and Wednesday to discuss how their militaries could ethically use AI. It was the first summit of its kind. It follows on the heels of the AI ethical principles that Eric spoke to, which were the first published by any uh, organization, the DOD, and it was hosted by the Jake. And it's uh, kicked off what Jake is calling the AI Partnership for Defense. This is something that we haven't had an opportunity to talk about as a commission, but I can state with certainty that we would endorse it and embrace it. And central to this is talking about the limits, the moral, legal, and ethical limits uh, that we want to establish for AI in national security applications. So I really take this meeting uh, as a very positive first step. Agreed. Do any of you know of any uh, international efforts, uh, including at the, the UN, uh, where this discussion and a framework for ethical use of AI is being undertaken with seriousness? The primary place right now is looking at the ethical, the, the use of autonomous weapons. 
and that is in the UN, the United Nations GGE Group of Government Experts as part of the CCW, the Conventional on uh, Certain Conventional Weapons. And that is very well attended by the Department of Defense and the Department of State. And that is the primary place where the debate over how far and in what form uh, AI uh, enabled autonomous weapons uh, can be or should be used on the battlefield. Very good. Thank you. Uh, with that, let me uh, yield to uh, Mr. Harrison for any questions he may have. Thank you. I was wondering if any of the panelists have a view on your uh, recommendation or your guiding principle number five, where you discuss principles of free inquiry, free enterprise, and free flow of ideas. The last line of that section says, at the same time, we must not lose sight of enduring American principles and overly securitize basic research or the private sector. I was wondering if you have some guidance for us on how to not overly securitize or to appropriately securitize uh, basic research. Um, the commission has spent a fair amount of time on this question of protection. And it's an obvious one. Uh, an American firm, an American researcher invents something very important. Um, what should we withhold and what should we try to, uh, uh, try to withhold or maybe we will be not successful? And the consensus of the commission seems to be that it's very difficult to withhold algorithms or even software because the algorithms are broadly known and they'll be discovered by the competitor anyway and the software is relatively reproducible. However, the insight from the commission is that there are significant parts of the hardware value chain which are very specialized and that deserve spe very special attention. Uh, maybe the other commissioners may want to add something to, to, to add color to my statement. Do any of the commissioners have any views on that to add? If none, okay. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Arson. Uh, Ms. Houlihan, uh, do you have additional questions? I do, I do, I appreciate that. Uh, my first question has to do with uh, my interest in developing the U.S. Digital Service Academy, uh, which of course would create a pipeline of security cleared federal employees, and that was part of your proposal. Can you highlight the key program uh, components of that program, and have you done any outreach to determine uh, if there's an appetite for students for such a program? There appears to be infinite appetite for this idea if we can find the money. Uh, Mignon, are you the best expert on this to comment on it? I will uh, give it a, a try. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, one of the things uh, uh, highlights um, that makes this uh, particularly appealing, uh, we believe it is modeled after um, you know existing academies. Um, we also know that existing academies uh, they are over flooded uh, with applications. So we think the interest would be there. Uh, we also think that uh, the interest would be there for those who uh, may not be able or uh, might not have the interest um, in moving into uh, you know, military service or reservist service afterwards. So the thing that um, is the most attractive, however, it is a, an incredibly um, a targeted pipeline uh, for all of the issues when we talk about the lack of talent um, and, and, and having broad um, uh, pathways for educational opportunities that are STEM or AI oriented, uh, this, this would happen uh, more robustly under this framework. Can I, can I add, Congresswoman, that um, in our specific proposal, this is an independent entity under the federal government, but it has a public sector, private sector board, uh, in our formulation, it would be able to raise private money in addition to federal money. Um, in theory, it would offer, it would be able to charge tuition and have requirements of payback and things like that. So very similar to the way our military academies operate. Um, and uh, this is perhaps our strongest recommendation. Um, and I don't think it's that difficult for the government to do. There's huge demand. There's plenty of universities that would love to advise us and help us. We've had outpourings from many of the states that we've spoken with and said, look, how can we help? What can we do? Yeah, it, so it sounds like a really intriguing concept and I think something that we 
probably should take a very hard look at. Uh, I also understand that you have been talking with industry experts and academics that have indicated that they'd like to contribute to government missions because of a sense of civic responsibility or interest in unique government missions, but they don't want to leave their current career field, uh, even temporarily. So as a result, you have made the recommendation to create a National Reserve Digital Corps. Could you all also please elaborate or highlight on the purpose uh, and the fundamentals of the Reserve Digital Corps, please? Minyan or myself? Either. Um, what this would do, it was pattern itself after um, our ROD, ROTC. It will allow for uh, a, a number of less than 40 uh, days of, of service. Um, it would uh, en enable the infusion of, of talent um, to, to troubleshoot, to triage, uh, and to overall to benefit the current ecosystem uh, when, it, when, it, when it comes to our government uh, with um, with giving those the flexibility to uh, meet whatever other needs in terms of economic needs um, that they wish to. The fact of the matter is, as it stands right now, uh, one of the biggest barriers uh, for serving full time in, in government is, is money, is resources. Academia and the private sector uh, attract oftentimes, um, you know, some of the better talent. And this is one of those ways that we would recognize that, leverage that um, without having somebody having to make a hard permanent choice. So I'm, I'm just making sure that I understand because I was ROTC in the Air Force and went to school with a full scholarship at Stanford and re repaid you know, that by serving. Are you suggesting that this is the same kind of a thing with existing colleges and a, and a pathway to repay, whereas the other concept is the same as the Air Force Academy in this analogy? If I've got, if, if, if I'm speaking the, the, uh, with the right pro, uh, in terms of the program, uh, that you, you, you're saying the reserve is correct? Yeah, the reserve the, digital core. Yes, ma'am. Right. It, it would be patterned after that. Um, all of the uh, benefits of, of that. Uh, I'm, would I'm just be, trying um, to drill down and understand just for myself what you mean by they don't have the time to commit because it seems as though me, me. I had a lot of commitment on the other side of, of, the, of the opportunity. Yeah. I, what I, what I guess what I'm saying in, in this particular case, um, you know, uh, sorry about the, uh, the miss, uh, is that, um, you know, someone who does not want to take a permanent um, military track. It, this is a somewhat but, lighter version yeah. of what you're describing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the ROTC, by the way, is a fantastic program that America has in our universities. Many of the leaders I've worked with have gone through ROTC, and it's a great way to bring bridges between civilian and the military sector, and those are lifetime lifetime uh, commitments, and you, you're obviously a tr success from that. Um, one way to think about this is we've got to get a way for people to be able to uh, work in the military, work for the military, but not be in the military. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this is a mechanism to do this. It is a structural mechanism where they can say to their employer, I am required to do this. You have to so let me do So it's a reservist this. rather the than reservist, an ROTC. Oh, the got reservist it. model. Okay. I, I apologize. I appreciate the clarification, and I yield back. No, and I apologize. I, 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 I apologize to you for the confusion. Okay. Very good. Well, um, we will uh, wrap up this hearing now. I want to thank our witnesses for the extraordinary testimony. Uh, for the extraordinary commitment uh, that you've made uh, uh, to the uh, National Security Commission on AI. Uh, we look forward to continuing to follow your work and uh, the, the final report. And again, your, your testimony today has uh, just been extraordinary and valuable. So with that, uh, I um, want to thank you again. And uh, this hearing now stands adjourned. And thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you.